Good morning, Solid Ground. How are you doing? It's so good to look over your shoulder by the second song. Church is usually pretty full. We always joke it takes us two songs to get into church. But well done for being here this morning. Give, just, give yourselves a hand. Let me find myself here. We've been uh, journeying through the book of Galatians or the letter to the Galatian church. Um, you can open your Bibles at Galatians 5. Um, for those of you that's new or that hasn't been following the, the um, series that we've been preaching into, so the, the overarching arching theme in, in Galatians is basically uh, the Apostle Paul write, writing to uh, the church in Galatia, which is a Gentile church. They, um, actually, uh, th- there was actually... Yeah, the speculation is that there was only a, like a handful of Jews around in that area, but uh, predominantly uh, uh, Gentile church, and uh, what had happened is the church had come to faith in Jesus Christ by grace through faith, the true gospel, and uh, Paul departed from them, and what happened was there was Judaizers that, that entered the scene and started proclaiming a message that these um, Gentiles had to subscribe to the letter of the law by being circumcised first and foremostly and to the rest of the Jewish law in order to maintain their salvation. And uh, we see Paul very strongly opposing this message because salvation is by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. We can't add to it. We can't subtract from it. That is the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, If that's the only thing you get this morning, you have done well. If you walk out of here with a sense in your heart that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, you have done well. That is the message of Galatians. Um, This message started, I said to Jono this morning, with with about 26 verses. And uh, I got to verse 6 from verse 1 to 6 in in Galatians, and I realized I had a whole preach. And I couldn't go any further, otherwise we'd be here for two days. That is how rich the passage of Galatians is, with just doctrine and God's word to us. Let's read from Galatians 5, verse 1 to 6. For freedom, say freedom. Freedom. Okay, no, say it like, you know, like William, who's who's watched Braveheart? Yes, say it like William Wallace says it. Freedom! Freedom! Yes, there we go. It's more like it. For freedom, Christ set us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. Say slavery, but say it soft. Because we don't celebrate slavery. We celebrate freedom, but we don't celebrate slavery. I'm going to start over because confu- I've com- confused you now. For freedom, Christ set us free. Stand firm them and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. Take note, I, Paul, am telling you, uh, telling you that you get yourself... Cir- uh, take note, I am telling you that if you get yourself circumcised... Christ will not benefit you at all. Again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obliged to the entire law. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace, for we eagerly await through the Spirit, by faith, the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith Uh, working through love. Let's pray. Father God, your word is the highlight of this morning, and we realize by just reading your word, your infallible word, our hearts are already turned towards you and towards your son and towards Jesus Christ, what he did for us on the cross, his birth, his life, his resurrection, his death. Father, I pray, Lord, that the message will come through clearly this morning. I uh, pray for myself, Father God, will you just protect me from saying anything that is not true? Will you help me to articulate this message in a way that you want me to articulate it, Father God? Help us to hear only what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In 2002, we had the opportunity of going to Tanzania, uh, to Dar es Salaam in particular, was one of our stops, and um, it was a beautiful place, and visiting a place called Bokomoyo, uh, where the slaves were taken to be loaded into the ships, to be taken to Zanzibar and uh, sold into the international slave market. There's a bit of a photo of what it looks like on the beaches of Bokomoyo. Uh, you can go one picture back. Just want to talk a bit about that. So, so that is what it looks like, the scene that you see. And, um, 
it was an interesting space because this is like, I don't know if you know the story of Zanzibar, but Zanzibar was sort of the place where, where slaves got sold into the, the international slave market. But what very people knew that there was actually a, a, a place on the continent that, that um, was, was gathering the slaves in that space and would ship them off. And these slaves would be kept in quite horrible conditions. Uh, the next photo, actually, you see there people loading these ships. So even today, these ships are used, or these boats are used to, to um, take supplies to Zanzibar. So these boats are actually on their way to Zanzibar with fresh produce and everything. But in those days, that would have been slaves being loaded on those ships. Uh, the next picture, what you see here, um, and it's, it's actually quite horrifying, these, these concrete pillars with a, with a um, uh, um, steel um, things on, poles on, you see there in the middle there's like a, a broken bowl. It's just people over the years have chipped off these things to take souvenirs. But that was actually a bowl that was sitting there around that pole. And the slaves would be chained around these, these steel pillars. This was actually a G German holding house for, for slaves before they get shipped off. And there was, they, they were chained with their hands behind their backs. And that bowl was their, was their feed, feeding trough. They were treated like animals. Okay, that was the feeding trough. And these guys would fight with their hands tied behind their backs for a bite to eat. It was horrific. It was ruthless. To say that people were treated like animals would be a complete understatement. And um, I remember walking on that beach and getting quite emotional of thinking what, what people can do to one another. But the other thought that came to my mind is this topic of enslavement, the way we are enslaved to a sinful nature when we are outside of Christ, the way that we can be even inside of Christ, still be uh, under the, the, the yoke of slavery in our lives. And that's what this passage speaks about. Galatians 5 is 1. You can take the pictures off. Thanks, Stefan. Galatians 5 says, For freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm them and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. Now, this, this word to submit literally means that you are bowing down, you are bowing your knee in service to something or someone. It means that you relinquish your own will and rights, and you surrender to the will of that which you are submitting to. The fact that Paul, the Apostle Paul uses the word again means that they were previously submitted to this, this yoke of slavery, and that they are actually returning to it. Okay, And he's saying, why would you want to return and submit yourselves again after you have tasted the freedom that Jesus gives us? We've, we've, we've spoken about this in, in previous sermons, but he's saying, why would you want to go back to that again? Why would you submit to yourself again to this slavery under this yoke? Literally speaking, a yoke is a wooden object that you would put on an ox's neck. I even read one commentary, I didn't actually put it in my notes, that they would actually use yokes on people as well, uh, as, as a, in, 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 uh, in, instead of using shackles to, to shackle people, they would put yokes on people's necks. But the most common sort of idea of a yoke is, is this wooden thing that you would put on an ox's neck uh, in order to control or steer the animal whether it was to plow a land or to pull a cart. This yoke was heavy. It was uncomfortable. It was designed to break and control the animal's will, to get the animal to do exactly what you wanted it to do and to steer the animal wherever you wanted to steer him. Now, Paul speaks about a yoke in uh, Galatians 5. He says, do not, um, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. What is this yoke? He is speaking about well i believe if you follow the letter of galatian and the overarching theme of galatians this yoke that t paul is talking about is the religious demands of the gospel of works that the galatians are being drawn back into that's being preached to them it's the belief in the false gospel that demands you work for your salvation and favor with god by maintaining the letter of the law that is the yoke that paul is talking about here and this, this slavery to the yoke of that. The false gospel is con this false gospel is completely opposed to the freedom found in the gospel of salvation through, through, uh, by grace through faith. 
remember the two themes that we spoke about, and I actually went and I wrote these, these, these two words on my board in my office, and I wrote the definition of them uh, in my own words just next to it, so that every time I look up at my board, I remind myself of what these words mean, the two words, mercy and grace. Mercy means I don't get what I deserve. What I deserve is punishment because of my sin, but I don't get punishment. Jesus got punished in my place. That is the gospel. And the word grace, me getting what I do not deserve, which is God's unmerited favor. So God takes what I deserve and he puts it on Jesus and he takes what Jesus deserves and he gives it to me. That is the gospel, friends. It's this great exchange that happens when we submit our lives to Jesus Christ. But Paul talks about a yoke, but I want to talk about three different yokes that we all carry. I believe each of us carry one of these yokes on our lives. First one is the yoke of sin, which leads to death. Second one is the yoke, yoke of slavery to religion and legalism, which leads to bondage. And the yoke of Christ, which leads to freedom. Yoke of Christ that leads to freedom. It sounds like an oxymoron. But we'll get to that. You'll understand once I'm done with the sermon. The yoke of being enslaved to sin, which leads to death, firstly, in Romans 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, friends, Christ died for all, but his death will not count for all. That is the gospel. Only those who acknowledge and submit themselves in a personal relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ, will be saved. So Jesus Christ goes to the cross, and he says that he dies for all, and this is the true gospel, that Jesus dies for all. But friends, that, that offer of that gift of salvation is only yours when you receive it. His death doesn't count for all. His death only counts for those who receive it. If you are not a reborn believer in Jesus Christ, it means that you are a slave to your sinful nature and desires. You carry the yoke of your sins. Your sins will be judged and you will be liable for the punishment, which is death and eternity in hell. This is the truth. This is not a, a turn or burn message. It's the truth of the gospel, friends. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the penalty for your sins is yours to carry. When that hammer goes down, that hammer and that judge will say guilty because you are outside of Christ. That is the reality. So that is the yoke of, of, of slavery to the sinful nature. The second yoke that we find in this Galatians 5 passage that we just read is the yoke of slavery to the law that leads to bondage. Three main losses that, that Paul sort of explains here that we incur when we submit ourselves to the yoke of slavery by turning from a position of grace to back into religion and legalism is found in verse 2 to 4 of Galatians 5. It says, firstly, Christ will not benefit you at all in verse 2. Verse 3 says you will become a debtor to the whole law. And verse 4 says you are alienated from Christ because you have fallen from grace. Now, these are very strong statements, and if you sit and you sort of shuffle to the front of your chair, I think you should, because we need to make sure we understand what the Word says here. We need to make sure that we understand the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ. Now, firstly, it's important to remind ourselves that Paul is speaking to believers. The letter to the Galatian church is to a church, a group of believers who's come to faith in Jesus Christ by grace through faith. The problem is they are busy backsliding. The, the problem is they are busy taking on a new doctrine. This doesn't cancel them from salvation. It means that they need to be corrected in their understanding. So on numerous occasions, I think it's like nine times that um, Paul actually refers to the church as brothers and sisters. Just a couple of them in 3 verse 27, he says to them, you are in Christ. Uh, Galatians 4 verse 6, he says, and because you are sons, uh, Galatians 4 verse 7, you are no longer slaves but sons. This is not a type of language that the Apostle Paul would use if, these, uh, if this church, if these believers were outside of Christ. It means that they are in Christ. Another thing that Paul is not advocating 
I believe, is he's not advocating that they lose their salvation. I mean, this language of falling out of grace. Christ will not benefit you at all. You become a debtor to the whole law. Often we can look at that and we can develop this sort of theology that you can lose your salvation. Because, quite frankly, if you just take that on face value, it, it seems like that is what it said. But we need to weigh Scripture up against Scripture, friends. We cannot develop a new theology that contradicts the rest of the New Testament, the rest of the New Testament letters. Ephesians 1 verse 13 says, Those who put their faith in Jesus is sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit seals us. Our salvation is kept safe by the Holy Spirit. We cannot lose it. John 6 verse 37 to 40. Everyone, say everyone. everyone. No, say everyone. everyone. This is an important one. You need to get it. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me will never, say never, never. will never be cast out. For I come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none. Say none. None, none of them uh, he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone. Say everyone. Everyone, everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. So the point I'm making, friends, is Paul, by saying we've fallen from Christ, by saying we, we will not benefit anything, we've fallen from grace, Paul is not advocating that we are losing our salvation. Because the rest of Scripture says that once you are saved, you are saved. You cannot lose your salvation. So what is he saying? Let's go through those three statements. Firstly, Christ will not benefit you at all. It means that you will find no earthly benefit in your relationship with Jesus when you rely on your own works. The one that chooses to rely on his own works and not in Jesus Christ as the, 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 the giver of all good things. We are not talking about relying on your own salvation, but we are talking about relying on Jesus Christ as the giver of all good, good gifts. Christ will not benefit you at all if you rely on your own works. There's nothing we can get from Jesus when we resist these hands of good works towards us. You become like the prodigal son who squanders in inherit his inheritance and wanted to live life on his own terms. I love the analogy of the prodigal son. Because the reality is, friends, if that son would have died in his fallen state, on his death certificate, or on, on, in, the, in, the, in the family records, would have still been uh, Johnny, son of so-and-so. At no point was the prodigal son not a son in the house. Yes, he was squandering inheritance. Yes, he was messing it up. But friends, he was still a son of the father. It's a beautiful analogy of not losing your salvation when we get things wrong. Yes, we want to get it right. Yes, holiness is a theme. But friends, we cannot fall out of salvation. But we become like the prodigal son when we have a wrong view. Or like the believer that Paul talks of in 1 Corinthians 3 who builds his house with perishable metal uh, materials such as wood, hay, and straw. It says that on the judgment day, his dead works will be burnt up, but he will be saved. There will be a sense of regret. You can go read that in, in, in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 15. And it says only as one through the fire, but he will be saved. Warren Wiersbe says it this way, he says, it's bad enough that legalism robs the believer of his liberty, but it also robs him of his spiritual wealth in Christ. The believer living under the law becomes bank, a, bankrupt, a bankrupt slave. That is what happens, that's what it means that Christ will not benefit you at all. The second statement is you become a debtor to the whole law. James 2 verse 10 to 11 says, Whoever keeps the entire law and yet submits at, at one point, uh, or yet stumbles at one point, is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you are a lawbreaker. You see, friends, Christians who fall back into legalism always walk in the position and posture of debt. You're always indebted to God if you walk in this posture of legalism. The banner over your life will always be guilty, bondage, must try harder, must do more. Oh my gosh, maybe I'm not saved because I've done X, Y, and Z. You fall in and out of salvation. That is your theology. That is what legalism does to us. Whilst the banner that Jesus gives us 
is forgiven, loved, son, heir, beloved, freedom. And he says it is finished. See, when Jesus breathes out his last breath on the cross, friends, that curtain in the Holy of Holies tears. And we get access into God's throne room. And he sets us free from the bondage of the law. That was a picture of the law being torn. And Jesus says, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to com complete it, to bring it to its fulfillment. So he paid the final price of the law so that we can be free. As a legalist, you will always experience God as that servant, the one talent guy that saw his, his master as a hard taskmaster. And, and, and I think the passage says that, that you are a hard taskmaster who reaps where you didn't sow. That's not the God that I know, friends. The God that I know is a generous father who gives good gifts. But the servant, because he had a wrong theology of the master, says to the master, you are a master who reaps where you didn't sow. And the legalist will always see God as that. God will always be the guy upstairs, that angry man with a stick ready to beat you. That's what legalism will do to your relationship with God. Instead of putting his talents to work out of fear, he hid them in the ground. Friends, the legalist will never experience the love and acceptance of the Father fully. We see Paul and Barnabas debating the Jerusalem council in Acts 15 verse 10. They say, now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? Here's the reality. If their ancestors could bear this yoke, there was no need for Jesus to come. But the reason why Jesus had to come and be born and live a life that we couldn't live and die a death in our place is because we couldn't hold the letter of the law, friends. It was impossible. For thousands and thousands and thousands of years, people have tried. Yet the, 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 the book of Galatians says that, that, uh, that the law wasn't bad. It was just a placekeeper to keep us from falling completely into sin. But you see, we couldn't bear it. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through grace, through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they were. They're speaking of Gentiles here yeah, that got saved. And they are saying, why do you want to weigh them down with this legalistic approach to the gospel when Jesus says we are free? By grace you have been saved, not by the letter of the law. The third statement that Paul makes as a result of being enslaved and in bondage is you are alienated from Christ because you have fallen from grace. Now once again, I want to advocate for this that, that he doesn't say that you have lost your salvation. By saying that, it would contradict so much of the New Testament. You see, the legalist will have a wrong view of Jesus. Due to this wrong view and understanding of grace, our experience and relationship with Jesus will be shipwrecked. My devotion and faith is watered down to a set of do's and don'ts, and you no longer operate within the sphere of God's grace. You'll not experience the benefit of God's promises to his people in this life because you have chosen to reject God's goodness towards you by living life on your own terms like the prodigal son. Like the salt that's lost the saltiness, your testimony of God's goodness will be weak and of little worth to kingdom advancement. And friends, the state, statement that you have fallen from grace means that the enemy has you exactly where he wants you. You see, what is objectively true of you when you are in Christ is that you are a son and an heir. You are adopted into God's household. You are his. You are in Christ. That is what is objectively true of you. But because the enemy cannot do something to your salvation and he can't do anything to take your salvation away, he gives us a wrong identity and a wrong view of who we are. And he comes with this legalism. And he gets you to submit again to the slavery of legalism, causing you to live like a spiritual orphan and a slave. The analogy is a caged lion 
that's been put in the wild and the door's been left open and the invite is to come out of your cage and come and enjoy the freedom, but out of fear and out of, out of just something inside of him, he stays in this cage and he never gets to enjoy this freedom that is presented to him. For freedom, friends, Christ has set us free. That line will never live in the blessing and the freedom of what is on offer to him. And that is how Christians live when they are living with one foot in the law and one foot in the grace. Paul warns the Galatians, he says, it only takes a little bit of leaven to spoil the whole bread or to leaven the whole bread. Thirdly, and this is the most important one, is the yoke of Christ that leads to freedom. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It means that you no longer carry the yoke of enslavement to your sinful desi desires and nature. Well, the temptation will still be there, but you're not, no longer enslaved to the sinful nature. The first thing that Christ does for us when we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior is to set us free, to take this yoke of sin, and he exchanges this for, for his yoke of righteousness. Once again, that great exchange. He takes our yoke of sin and he gives us a yoke of his righteousness, his love and his liberty. Where do I get this thing of the yoke of Christ? Because it sounds like, a, a, like I say, a bit of an oxymoron. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus' words here practically sums up the book of Galatians. The yoke of sin and bondage will leave you weary and burdened, walking crouched over by the weight and the demands of life and this legalism and sin and everything. So if you walked in here this morning and you are bowed over by the weight of your sin, friends, Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, I will set you free. I will give you life. The yoke that Jesus offers us through the gospel of grace, through faith, will save you from eternal death by giving you eternal life, set you free from the burden, which is the yoke of slavery under the law, by replacing it with his yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. Interesting, this word easy literally means a yoke that is kind and gracious. In contrast to the slave masters of sin that will take and take and take, that will reap where they didn't sow, that will weigh down on you. Matthew 16, 24. Let's backtrack a bit. So why do we wear a yoke as believers? It may seem like a, like a weird thing. Why do you want to say we wear a yoke as believers? Well, I believe the answer lies in Matthew 16, verse 24. It says, take up your cross. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. You see, for the legalist, this passage means no, 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 no. Don't, 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 don't. For the one that walks in freedom in Christ, It's a life of yeses, saying yes to Jesus, saying yes to what is right, saying yes to the good things in life, saying yes to what is freeing me up. It's a glass half empty and half full sort of conversation. To the legalist, the Bible is a book of do's and don'ts. It's a book of rules. To the one that is free in Christ, this book sets you even more free. This book is a whole lot of yeses. You see, in the Garden of Eden, they could eat of every tree in the garden, and one was a no. So there was a multitude of yeses and one no. Satan comes in and he says, did God really say that you're not allowed to eat from any tree in the garden? See what legalism does. It makes us see the glass half empty while God says, no, it's half full. We need to see God's message here. The Christian life, friends, is a life full of yeses, full of joy, full of freedom. Band, you guys can come up.
question I want to ask is, what enslaves you this morning, friend? Is the banner over your life not good enough? Guilty? Must try harder? Slave and orphan? Or have you embraced the good news of the gospel of grace that says forgiven? Say forgiven. I say it loud. Say it's forgiven. Is there a banner of forgiven over your life? Is there a banner over your life that says saved? Freedom, beloved son and daughter. Is there a banner of Jesus Christ over your life that says mine? Is there a banner over your life that says in Christ? Or have you submitted yourself again to this yoke of slavery that says not good enough, guilty, I must try harder, I'm a slave, I'm an orphan. You see, it's, it's possible to have a foot in each camp, friends. Once again, Paul is writing to Galatian church, to believers, who's got a foot in each camp. And he says, don't submit, don't submit. Preparing for the sermon this morning, just getting my, back to my analogy of, of Bokomoyo. Stefan, can you put that picture of that steel post just up for us again? I was praying into the service this morning. And God gave me this picture of people standing around these concrete pillars, bound up. Like slaves. Sons and daughters. Bound up. Because they've submitted again to the yoke of slavery. Chained up around these concrete pillars of religion and legalism fighting for the scraps like orphans and slaves. Just close your eyes for a minute. Just have this picture of people standing around those concrete pillars with their hands bound and eating out of this little bowl in the middle fighting for the piece of food. And I believe some of us are living like that. I believe that is that some of our lives this morning. If you're outside of Christ, that is definitely you, friend. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that is definitely you. You are bound up by your sinful nature. You're a slave to that sinful nature. You know what the Father says? He says to the psalmist, I've prepared a table a feasting table in the presence of your enemies. So while we're standing bound up because we submitted again to the yoke of slavery, God says, I've prepared a table for you, my friend. There's a feasting table in the presence of your enemies. Jesus quoting Isaiah 61 in Luke 4. He gets up and he reads a scroll in the temple. Luke 4 verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set free the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Friends, I believe Jesus is proclaiming released to the captives this morning. As says the Holy Spirit is moving through this auditorium. Recovery of sight to the blind. I don't think he's speaking of physical. Yes, Jesus came to do physical miracles. But spiritual blindness, blindness to this blind spot of being enslaved to our sinful nature and being enslaved to this legalist way. He wants to set you free this morning. He wants to proclaim the year of his favor over your life. I love this passage in Leviticus 26. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. What Egypt is in your life this morning? I know this was a physical place. But I believe, I believe it is safe to say that that, that the picture of Egypt can represent something in our lives that is not of God, a place of slavery. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you would no longer be their slaves. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to live in freedom. That is what God's word is over this church this morning, friends. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Amen. Let's stand and worship.